brands used to be about trading, about selling goods. Um, we think relating to the Nike story, they're, they're very much now about building relationships. So, I mean, everyone kind of knows that. I think this is a great example of Levi. I mean, Levi make jeans, right? That's what we know them for, and that's what we kind of love them for. Um, but they recognize that just selling jeans isn't enough anymore. So they kind of looked beyond the product and saw where people are using them. And so this example in, in the US, and they also applied it into parts of Europe, there's a big community of commuters that cycle to work now in different parts of the world, and that's growing. And a lot of them wear jeans. And you know, work space has become a lot more casual, and a lot of people wear jeans to work. So uh, actually, denim jeans are not the most practical thing to cycle in. So they started bringing out new products that were commuter specific. They started adding additional products that related to cycling. They started creating these commuter clubhouses and hosting people so you could stop off and you could buy spare parts, you could get your bike checked out, you could even have a cup of coffee in some of them. So while it might not seem like Levi's core business, it kind of depends how you define their business because if they are about clothing people you know, in an urban, urban environment for their, for their workplace, then it does kind of make sense. So it's interesting, I think, if you look beyond product to purpose and think about what kind of purpose people are trying to use and fulfill, then these are the kind of interesting examples that you're going to find. Apple, obviously, is a, another great example. Um, and I think, you know, they they're kind of developing these relationships by, you know, whether it's Think Different or Nike's just do it, they're kind of looking beyond uh, their own product categories. Back to Nike, um, but as we said, it's more about relationships than, than, than pure trading. And just as an example of that, I've talked a lot about uh, Nike Plus, but 200 million fans every day use Nike Plus to achieve things in sport. So starts with a little running club in San Francisco and then grows into a running club in Seattle and then one in Hong Kong and then one in Taipei and so on and so forth and suddenly you've got 200 million people that are active users every day not a 200 million base they're the active users every day so quite an incredible uh, community story and back to my diagram so brand on the left if you look at you know their brand message I love the if you have a body you're an athlete so that's the kind of philosophy that, that drives the Nike brand. And then you've got the social clusters that are interested in different sports, different activities. And Nike have just done a great job of creating all these different touch points. So a kind of ecosystem of, of touch points that really bring those two groups together in, in very interesting and unique and different ways. So let me talk a bit more about that middle part, the experience. So when? We're all time starved. We're all getting very edgy about how much time we've got to spend doing this and how much time we've got to spend that and how much time it takes to travel there and how much time, it takes, you know. We, we all feel like we're getting edgier and edgier about time. So it's kind of becoming the scarcest resource uh, for all of us. And we've only got 24 hours in a day. So how can we use them effectively? Um, we think that Consumers in the sort of 21st century want the kind of version of timelessness um, on, on a timetable that really matches them and their needs and they, these kind of uh, the, these new standards of this digital generation. And by that, I don't just mean young people; I mean the collective population. Um, and, and the shift that we're, we're kind of talking about with a lot of our brands is that rather than thinking about how do I get more attention, how do I, get, how do I talk to these people, when they're walking through Times Square and they're looking at their handphone, how do I get their attention? Instead of thinking of it from that point of view, we're suggesting that they think about the time investment. It's like, why would you spend time with me as a brand you know, if, I've, if I'm just trying to sell you a product these days? You probably won't. So I've got to add some value. I've got to, I've got to make the most of that time for you, and then you'll respect me, and then you might do business with me. So we've come up with this sort of phrase, which we're using uh, a lot, which is all about spending time and saving time. And it's a really interesting filter to put on any brand story. So if you look at any brand, and look at all the different touch points they have, and look at the ones that are helping their customers save time, and the ones that add value when they spend time with them, 
it's a really interesting way to analyze a brand. I'll give you an example. This is a um, thing we worked on, on with Starbucks called the Reserve Roastery. So, you know, whether you're a Starbucks fan or not, they tend to be quite polarizing, but um, a lot of people out in the world love Starbucks, and a lot of people are being brought into coffee connoisseurship and coffee culture through those kind of chains that are kind of opening up. And if you look at Singapore, it's incredible how many little coffee shops and great baristas there are now. So, you know, this, this is a movement that's really kind of taking over the world. You know, Starbucks uh, have been part of that, and, um, and so the Reserve Roastery is a place where you can go and really learn about, you know, coffee in all, all its forms, right from the beans and where they come from and how they're harvested and roasted. And so there's a lot of this kind of connoisseurship activity um, across a lot of different categories, and this was one example for Starbucks. So here, it's worth me spending time because I'm going to learn something, and it doesn't cost me anything. I can go, I can book a, a space here, I can attend kind of... Um, uh, courses on how to become a great barista and things like that. So, great way to spend my time. On the other hand, when I'm sitting at work and I want that cup of Starbucks, but I'm really challenged because I'm, I'm really busy, I don't want to spend time lining up in a queue. So, Starbucks thought about that and they thought, okay, in certain places, no time, no line. So, they've got an app where you can just order your favorite Starbucks and it appears on your desk 10 minutes later or 15 minutes later. So that's a great example of saving time for the customer. So very simple examples, but I think um, you know, looking through that lens, uh, really helpful. Great example, Estee Lauder. This is in uh, uh, Beijing Airport. Typically, you go to any beauty hall in any department store or any beauty uh, area duty-free in a, a transport environment in an airport, um, You've got gondola, 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 gondola. You've got all the different brands and they're all arranged in the same way and they've all got a key visual and they all look the same. Now, Estee Lauder thought there's got to be a better way to serve people. Um, and the interesting thing about that is like if you're looking for, I don't know, a fragrance, for example, you know, you kind of walk around and you spray a tester on one, one uh, side and then you spray one on the other side and then you get to the third one and you're kind of lost. So it's, it's a kind of process that is ingrained in that category, but actually it's not very well thought through from a customer journey point of view. Estee Lauder have said, let's just sit people down and we'll bring the products to them. Let's turn this into a kind of consulting arrangement. So you know, we sit people down, we can give them a drink, we can kind of, so it's a hospitality-based experience. And you know, people often have transit time in airports, they're prepared to sit down and spend a bit of time with us, explore new things that they haven't tried before. So it's a great opportunity for us to consult with them, find out what skin type they are and, and do all that kind of analysis, uh, but do it on their terms and we bring the products to them. So let's make it a more relaxing and enjoyable experience. So again, if I'm gonna spend time with this brand, then they're kind of facilitating it really well. On the flip side, I'm, I'm, I'm dashing through the airport on a Friday night, I'm trying to get home, and I know I want my favorite cup of Nespresso first thing on Saturday morning, and I've run out of the capsules. Nespresso have got a great answer for that. They've put these luxury vending uh, points in some airports in Europe so far. So save time, you know, again, great solution, great example. This one I really like. It's, um, it's a, it's, it's a crowd-funded uh, um, uh, device that uh, I think has just been launched, a thing called Ruby, and um, it's, it's really cool. Basically, um, you put it in your shoes, just clip it in your shoes, and if you tap your heels, uh, it will activate uh, a pre-programmed um, uh, response using your smartphone. So, for example, you're going on a date, and you're not sure if it's going to be a good date or a bad date, so you program Ruby to call your phone. Doesn't matter what number, it just calls your phone. So you're sitting there on your date, <laughs> don't like this guy, mm, not very nice. So click your phone rings, oh sorry, gotta go, and you go. So I thought I'd throw that one in, but you can, you can use it to order an Uber or you can do all sorts of things. So it's a, a fun little gadget, but I think brands are also about having um, a bit of a personality as well now. So these are the kind of things that you're seeing more and more, particularly with startup brands. Somehow, kind of corporations aren't allowed to have a personality, but startup brands are allowed to have them. So I think we're seeing kind of change of, of, of balance there as well. Um, this is one that we did for Lego, and um, 
It's really interesting. The, the, the hardest thing you can possibly do is persuade a retailer to take stock out of their space. But we managed to persuade Lego to do a little experiment and we turned the centre of the store into a play space. So we said, look, people come in with their kids, they want to get engaged, they want to get involved, they want to play. And, and Le Lego itself uh, comes from Lego, which means play well. So the very literal translation of their name is all about playing well. But there was no opportunity to play in the space. So we turned it into a play space, cut a long story short, we took about 30% of the product off the shop floor, took it out of the store, we increased sales by about 30%. So it's not always about stock, and it's not always that more product display means more sales. But there are a few other challenges. One was that um, the, the ranging of the product um, was uh, rather random, and it was themed. But actually, people tend to buy by age, and people grow higher as they grow up. So we started ranging product by age vertically, which is kind of fun. And we also, um, now I don't know if I can run this, but also all the product in the Lego stores is in a box. And you can't actually open the products. So we created this augmented reality app which allows you to unbox the product virtually so you can actually see what's inside. So there's the product. And it's a fun thing for the kids to play with. Okay. So spend time, save time. And then finally the, the wear bit. Um, a lot of our clients, brands, retailers talk about the channels. You know, this type of channel for, you know, we've got flagship stores, we've got tier one stores, we've got this kind of store, we've got that kind of store. Um, we encourage them to think less about channels and more about touch points. We don't believe that brands can differentiate in everything they do universally anymore. You know, there are too many players in every category to be totally differentiated at every level. So what we suggest brands do is focus on some key defining touch points, so moments, if you like, interactions in the customer journey that really define what that brand is all about. So as I showed with Nike, for example, it's about having those, you know, half dozen, six, seven, eight kind of key touch points that you can take to a flagship, you can take into a small store, you can do it as a pop-up, you can do it in all sorts of different ways. Um, but they remain the defining features of what we call the experience signature. So add, add those key touch points together and that becomes the signature for that brand. Um, now, I know I'm throwing a lot of theories here, but, um, but I'm also giving away all our secrets as well, so there we are. Um, when we think about touch points, traditionally, um, if you think about a retail space, um, the way you, we used to design spaces was, first of all, we design the space and it's, you know, everyone's happy with it, we've got great visuals, it's going to look fantastic. We've got good customer circulation, all those things, fantastic. Now, we want to put some technology in. And there was a bit of a sense a few years ago of just add iPad. So if you put a few iPads in your store, it's going to perform better. So there's this sort of layering in of digital technologies into stores, lots of screens, lots of iPads, you know, we're going to sell more product. Didn't work. But the digital component tended to come later. Um, then, just before opening, it's like, hang on, we need to train our staff. So, we better think about, you know, what kind of sales targets they need to reach and what kind of compensation packages they're going to have and all that kind of stuff. The problem with that is you end up with a very disconnected, disjointed customer experience. Because people walk into a store, I'll give you an example, I don't have it here, but uh, we did some work with the body shop. and. Um, and we just observed someone in the store. So this customer came in, engaged with a member of staff, really interested in uh, kind of working on their skincare regime. So the girl's talking about, you know, skin type and all this kind of thing. And she said, so, you know, for in this particular situation, you should try this product. And then um, uh, at night time, you should use this product. And then if you want a kind of uh, rejuvenation thing, then there's this product here and, 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 and the poor girl that was trying to sell, tell this story and, and explain the whole body shop range was, was kind of really struggling. So 
we introduced a little pull-out shelf that you just pull out and a little amenity tray. So it's got little cotton wool pads and things like that. So as, as she's building the collection, building the regime, she could actually display it to the customer. Very simple thing, but, um, but it's, it's an example like that where you've kind of got to think first about the staff-customer interaction that you want to take place and then start thinking about what kind of technologies or do I need any digital technology to help facilitate that, to make it easier, to reference more information, to make it simpler? And what kind of situation is ideal for that kind of uh, interaction? So now we tend to start with the interactions first and then build out from there. So a project we did in India for a paint company called Asian Paints, but um, one of the simplest things that people want to do is that when people are painting their homes and they, they're selecting colours, they're very conservative and people are very risk averse and they want to know exactly what it's going to look like. So we created a technology um, that uh, basically allowed people to choose colours and uh, scan in a picture of their home and then change those colours and see what it was going to look like and change the lighting conditions and things like that. Now the core to that is actually this person here, the consultant, who can actually help you know, advise uh, the, the customer um, what kind of colours might look good in a particular situation, what kind of mood they tend to sort of create, um, and things like daylight versus uh, ambient light conditions, all that kind of stuff. Now, selecting colours you know, can be done by looking through swatches on a screen and dragging and dropping things and stuff, but it's not much fun and it's not very immediate. And people don't believe colours they see on screens are going to be the same as the colours that they're going to get on their walls. So we created these colour cubes. And there's a whole wall of these colour cubes, so you can sort of scan through different colour shades and things and then pick the, the, the colours you're interested in. Then you drop them on this turntable, they have RFID tags inside, very simple technology. Drop them on the turntable and they map onto the walls on the picture. And as you move them around you change how they map across. And as you turn them it changes the shade of each colour. So you can do a lot of things um, by just playing with those cubes and you can obviously swap them around. The really, really fundamentally important thing here is that it's the customers that are moving the cubes and choosing the cubes. So many times we see interactions where the staff are doing the stuff for the customer and it's amazing. Um, I mean, we've got stories where we've tracked sales where customers are engaged versus staff showing people. As soon as people touch stuff and play with it, they're infinitely more likely to buy. So it's really important that we put the control in the hands of the customer and that this person acts as a coach and an advisor. Um, I'll show you a little bit more of that case study in a, in a, in a second just to, uh, to, to finish off. Um, sorry. So I mentioned before, because of the way that these things used to be designed with the sort of physical spaces and then digital added in and then sort of um, staff kind of uh, taught to sort of deal with it, uh, everything was rather fractured and sporadic. So now it's about pulling things together into these kind of key touch points to create this experience signature. So um, what I wanted to do uh, just to, to finish off is um, take you through a, um, that Asian Paints case study um, as an example um, and, uh, and, and show you what we mean by experience signature and what these kind of key touch points uh, are. So this, is, this was the Asian Paints experience uh, previously. Uh, so if you wanted to uh, redecorate your home, you'd probably talk to a contractor straight away. Uh, he'd give you a few colour swatches. You'd go down to the paint store, which might look like this, and that was supposed to inspire you to help you decide what you were going to buy. Um, we did some research, um, and what we found, which really amazed us actually, and really surprised us, was that um, while well, you think of India as very, very colour confident as a, as, a, as a nation and everyone wears bright colours and things, when we went, and these are literally the pictures that we took, and we haven't photoshopped them, we haven't changed them. These were the homes, so colour, 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 but look at the walls. Look at the furniture. Completely neutral. So we found that actually in their home decor there was no colour confidence at all. So we basically, our, our proposition became help India build colour confidence in their home. That's what we're trying to do. So the first thing we did was created a, a flagship experience which was like a walk-in decor magazine. 
So um, as you engage with this space, it's really like kind of opening up the pages of, uh, of, a, of a magazine. As you walk in, the first thing you're invited to do is choose your favorite color. Really, really simple engagement strategy just to kind of get people to think about what color they like. So in, in one of the stores, they step on these pads. That triggers their favorite color to go up through the, uh, um, the color cloud above this sort of chandelier and it goes out onto the facade of the building. So it gives them an immediate connection with the space. They then go into an area which is all about uh, building their kind of confidence, it's all about education. So they use these little dioramas to see how colour and light kind of change. They can also, they stand in this space and they can project different colours behind them and kind of choose uh, a colour that makes them feel good. So colour and mood. And when they like it, they take a snapshot of it. As they go around, in the top there, there's a, there's a room set that you can stand in. And it has like the advertising tri-graphic system for walls. So we can change the colour while they're standing there in a physical form. So they can kind of see what, what a conservative, a mid and a kind of more ambitious colour might feel like. And wherever they go, they carry this card with them so they can tap and collect the things that they like. So no matter what they are, it doesn't matter, you know, it's no orchestration, it's just, you know, tap anything that you like, you see, just tap, and it will address you by name, and it will uh, load that onto your card. We also look after the kids, really important part of retail, making sure that the kids are happy, so they have lots of fun. And this interaction is our kind of, the start of our Nike Plus in this, in, in this example. So, with this lady, you know, she just put in very basic details, just put in a name, it was tagged to her card, off you go, there's your card. Didn't have to put in any other details. She's collected all her ideas, as you'll see in a little video in a minute. At the end of the journey, she hands over a card, all of the things that she's collected are collated into a magazine and printed on the spot and given to her. So she gets her own personalised colour magazine with her picture on the front. That also, if she elects to, creates a new space for her on the Asian Paints kind of cloud, if you like. So that's her project space. So now, if she sees anything, you know, she's walking down the street, she sees something she likes, she can just uh, tag it with her, her phone and put it into that cloud space using an app. Very simple. If she likes a particular colour on the wall, she can scan it, and it'll give her the Asian Paints reference colour for it. She adds it into her space. So it starts the, the relationship. It starts building that. Uh, these are the colour cubes that I've talked about already, but you can see the colour wall up at the top there. And also there's a link into the consultation. So once you start that consultation, that can continue online as well. We can't just stop at big flagship stores. We've also got to deal with the uh, 50,000 stores, uh, uh, dealer stores that Asian Paints have across uh, the whole of India. So this is a tier one dealership. So every touch point that you've seen so far is in here, it's just in a smaller or simpler format. So that's what I mean about touch points. They should be scalable, but we shouldn't lose the interaction or, or, or the kind of signature moment. And then this is the, uh, uh, some of the app stuff that we created, which, as I say, kind of keeps, uh, keeps the dialogue going. It enables people to manage their project. So if they're doing a full home decor project, they can manage it on here. It also means if they are really proud of what they've done, because a lot of um, decoration in India and China, for example, is also about kind of showcasing your great ideas at the end. Um, so you can showcase your ideas if you choose to, and they have competitions and give prizes for the best ones and stuff. So it's a quick video just to wrap that together.
So, kind of summarises uh, uh, that project. But as I say, like every brand we work with, this is our, our kind of uh, our, our north star, our, our kind of map, and it's really those touch points centred around the uh, the app that really um, drive that relationship. And there's some stats there that uh, they refer to. Last slide, I mentioned at the beginning uh, that we. Uh, have a kind of commercial view and we're, we're very keen in our early meetings with, with brands and clients to talk about uh, measures of success and how we kind of monitor progress um, and you know increasingly we're getting into this kind of uh, this type of cycle so we're measuring dialogue so how much social dialogue is going on around the brand how positive is that dialogue and uh, and how, f how much is that dialogue trans uh, uh, translating into traffic uh, so what are the trigger points that kind of turn that dialogue into activity? Uh, once we've driven traffic, you know, um, and we're getting the right kind of footfall or we're getting kind of uh, visitors to both our e-commerce sites and our, and our physical stores and things, how are we kind of tracking that, seeing what behaviours are happening, how can we uh, improve and modify that? How's that translating then through to sales and conversion rates and things? And once converted, assuming we've created our Nike Plus and we're staying with the customer, building the relationship, how do we use that to drive positive dialogue to create the virtual circle? So, so it's kind of simple three steps, but actually, you know, in the context of any brand, any client, it's a, it's a useful start point to think about how we might track success. So that's uh, kind of what we've covered there. In summary, so what can I buy from you? If you remember, so what can I achieve with you? Um, think about that Nike Plus example from trading to the relationships and the value of time, spend time, save time, uh, from channels to these kind of seamless touch points, so, uh, and, and making sure that enough of those touch points represent really significant, memorable kind of moments that add up to an experience signature. And that's it. And I think I'm just on time. There we go. So I think it's uh, yes. questions. If, uh, Do you have any questions from the audience? Any clarifications? Any Overwhelmed? Ah, there we go. Uh, one question is for the, the separation of the spend time and save time to buy. And it's sort of like to give your view. I can envision a time where the save time thing is going to hit a paper point. You know, even when Joe and Amazon has its going within its same day delivery, eventually I think you hit some tapering point. You can't keep, you know, more or less like Moore's Law, you can't keep. Yeah. You're still doing the same time. Would you see a time then when the whole spending time element becomes your only viable option? Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, I, I think if the save time stuff is taken care of, that that becomes foundational. It becomes you know a, a sort of hygiene in any any category. Of course, you can have all your groceries delivered to your door. Everyone does that. I mean, you know that's that's bench uh, ba base level. But what on top of that? You know, why why can I not go to a cold storage and have cooking classes and learn about new recipes and you know and we're seeing all sorts of interesting things um, happening in the grocery sector, for example, that, that are starting to sort of push that way. Um, so I think we'll see a lot more of that, particularly in physical retail. I think the, you know, the great thing about phys physical retail is it can deliver you know, very tangible, great experiences. And yet, I'd say 95% of stores that you walk into around the world today are still about displaying product on shelf, principally. So you know, even a Louis Vuitton store is still product on shelf. 
So, is there anyone from Louis Vuitton here? Have I just offended someone? No, good. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, you know, that's where the roles are changing. And I think, um, you know, the whole world from supply chains and everything else has been re-engineered to kind of get things, you know, very quickly straight to us and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but that's great. And, uh, and I think all the more of that because that, that gives us a really good, strong purpose for, for doing more interesting things in physical spaces as well. There's obviously a, a value chain or a branding value chain that starts somewhere and is at the end to achieve all the things that you're talking about here. And I'm wondering about your experience in Asia. Where do you find the most resistance with Asian CEOs? trying to explain all the importance of the, the importance of all of these value points and how they should consider adopting some of these, experimenting with some of these, particularly the relationship between the inside and the outside, employees, culture, mm -hmm. and customers. Um, forgive me for a rather trite answer, but um, the most resistance comes from Europe and America. Right. I find working with CEOs in China, they want the world they, they, they want the future, they want it very quickly, and it's kind of blank sheet of paper as far as they're concerned. So if we're trying to, because uh, the great thing for them is they don't have the legacy systems, they don't have the legacy infrastructure, they don't have their staff trained in particular ways uh, to the same extent. So I think, you know, talking to department stores in, in North America, uh, for example, um, is, 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 I think they're aware of it. Um, in, in fact, you know, we've been doing some work in, in North America with department stores where they're definitely aware of it. But when you put forward the future and what that department store of the future could be, when you put that in front of them and they look at the implications of that in terms of changing their organisation, they, you know, it, it quickly unravels. Whereas I think if you put that in front of uh, clients in, in, in China, for example, um, you know, they're very excited, they can make it happen in many cases, and um, we're, we're now talking about the Chinese consumer as the most advanced consumer in the world, because they've grown up as very digitally literate, they're really into e-commerce, but they're also the most avid shoppers, uh, they don't have all those sort of legacy habits and things that, that, that the rest of us have got, so they don't expect to necessarily have to go to a shopping mall to buy a product. Um, so there's got to be a better reason to go to a shopping mall than just picking up stuff. Um, so I, I genuinely think that, that I've got an easier job here, to be honest, than my, my colleagues in other parts of the world. You know, things of the Asian things, um, I think the change is pretty dramatic. Uh, from old style to new approach, how long did it take? Was it a gradual process? How much did it cost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually you get to the cost question. Um, We've been working with Asian Paints for just over 10 years, uh, so it's, it's, it's not an immediate process, but, um, um, but what's kind of interesting was when we started working with them, we identified a kind of brand progression which, which had three stages to it, and we sort of said, look, you know, you can be the experts in paint, you could be the, the kind of experts and advisors in colour and colour confidence, or you could kind of take more responsibility for colour and sort of lifestyle. And they said, we're very comfortable with one. We'd like to get to two, but three is a step too far. This was in the early days. We've now very much landed in step two, and we're now looking at step three. So they're now moving beyond decor, and they're moving into other categories, and they're doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and they're acquiring other, other businesses. So, um, you know, it does take time. But I think um, it probably took us about, about three years to have the level of impact that they wanted from the outset. And, and part of that was because finding sites in Mumbai, for example, or Delhi for those flagship sites uh, in, in themselves took almost a year um, to find those sites. So, you know, typically two to three years to have, have, have the real impact. Uh, in terms of cost, um, <laughs> if I add it all together, um, I mean, I suppose our typical engagements um, involve uh, a certain amount of uh, investigation and, and kind of looking at current habits and things like that, uh, defining what we think that future experience could be um, and agreeing that with the management team, sort of road mapping between where they are now and what that future experience could be, so we're at a road mapping stage. 
Um, we then, in the first phase of that, whatever we've picked out that we need to design, we design that stuff and we do things like, uh, um, uh, not sales training, but we do kind of uh, um, staff interaction workshops and things to kind of get that going. Um, and then once we've got a formula that we think is working, we then help to amplify that in, in, in different ways. And, and that typical process can take anything between sort of six and 12 months, probably in the cost region of 500,000 to 750, 800. So that's give you a rough idea. But the, I suppose the, um, the important thing is that um, yeah, the, 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 the client organisation has to be in it for a, for a kind of long-term play. And it's got to be multiple stakeholders as well now. I mean, uh, we were having a discussion earlier about you know, um, the, the, the pressure now probably back on, on the academic world to sort of respond to some of these things is probably harder than it is for us even in the industry because I think um, you know, it's all about seamlessness, it's all about inter interweaving different facets of businesses and things and, and from a design point of view it's really hard to kind of just employ a graphic designer or a, an interior designer or a multimedia specialist or a, a social media person or whatever because you know, if they sit in their box they're not actually going to be that much use to us they've got to be able to think in terms of the whole experience and add their part into it in the context of what everyone else is doing so so you know that's that's a tough part and it's the same for clients as i say you know for for a lot of established big corporations that have these siloed you know departments and businesses getting them to talk to each other and, and re-engineer their business to work effectively is is very difficult Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, we do um, uh, at least one project a year with a, with a um, charity or a, a non-profit organisation of some sort because, and our, and our challenge in those is how can we take our, our learnings and key design principles to, you know, um, the, those that really need it. And um, I, I think in some ways more so, I mean, I think the onus is on us as, a, as, a, as an industry uh, to really leverage our skills because I think we can answer a lot of those kind of issues um, but um, but they're exactly the same I mean most charities most NGOs operate as brands you know and there's there's a there's a kind of customer and there, there's the brand and there's an experience in between so we can apply the same thinking same principles Uh, no, it's still about touch points. Touch points can be anything. They can be digital, they can be face-to-face -face communication, they can be all sorts of things. It's just about you know, the context of where the brand and the, c and the customer, if you like, the user, meets. So they could be interacting online, interacting in person, interacting in a space, whatever. So, um, so you know, I think um, one, of, one of our challenges as, as a business actually is, uh, is kind of redefining retail in many ways. Yeah, because we, we, we are tagged very much as a retail agency, but, uh, but retail is a lot more than shops now. So, um, so we tend to think more broadly, but, um, but I think it's, it's really about relationship building at the end of the day and, and you know, how that relationship starts and, and how, you, how it kind of unfolds and what, what interactions and touch points you need to make that happen. Mm. in these kinds of engagements, what, what, what metrics would a, a client um, look at in order to get some confidence that it's working? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting field because I think it's, it's sort of relatively young. Um, um, we, as I mentioned with that circle, we, um, we, we tend to use social listening as, as the primary thing. We, we, we kind of think that 
uh, using simple social listening tools gives you a kind of dipstick into the general sentiment of a brand um, and its, its kind of current status. Um, so we kind of start with that and there are lots of listening tools out there. You can either pay for them, you can get them free, but that's, that's kind of where we start. Um, what we're then interested in is um, any, any indicators that show you know, how that is influencing uh, activity. So are there any particular uh, triggers that, that prompt people to actually go and look for more or, or, or discover stuff? So, um, so we'd look at trigger points. Then we're trying to equate that to traffic. Um, and the difficulty we have at the moment is unless you've already started some kind of relationship with that customer, it's very hard to connect those two parts together. But you know, even anonymously, at least we can see if there's a sort of you know a, a noticeable increase in traffic given something that's happening on social media, for example. Um, we're trying to and have um, got to a stage where we can now track um, in parallel uh, the same kind of parameters that you get online in a physical store. So using different camera technologies, we've actually created our own technology for that. Um, using Xbox cameras, um, funnily enough, but um, uh, it just you know tracks movement around a store. You can do heat mapping, you can do that um, that kind of thing, and see how that's influencing sales. And then you can most of the the, the places that we design now, much like I mean, one of my colleagues said this is like when I design a website, if a client says that button needs to be bigger and I say, no, it's not, it should stay the same size. And the client says, no, make it bigger and we make it bigger and then sales go up 3%, that client's right. So you can't get away from it with websites and e-commerce sites and all that kind of thing. But in a store, you know, if that client says, uh, move that gondola to the right five inches and then sales go up, I mean, who can argue with that? Um, but we, we're kind of trying to apply some of those same principles so we can test things we can look at different circulation paths, we can look at different visual merchandising techniques, things like that, and see how it influences uh, impact on sales in the same way as we could on a website. And then, you know, the cardinal sin these days, I think, is if someone does make a purchase, we've got to go with them. You know, we've got to find a way of uh, making it useful enough for them to want to stay in touch with us. And then we can, we can really start tracking. So building our database of 200 million active users every day, you know, with every brand we work with is, is the kind of goal. But, um, you know, if you look at companies uh, like L2 in America, a uh, great company, they, they sort of mine the internet for, uh, for information and they uh, s share these amazing strategic insights just by sitting there and data mining. So I think uh, the whole kind of big data thing in relation to metrics is, uh, is a big part of this. Most of our clients have a lot of data they just don't get a lot of intelligence from it, so um, so there's there's a lot to be done there. Mm. Okay, uh, with the social element, there's going to be lots of viral effects in terms of comments and the, you know the users, for example, the Nike experience. Um, do you actually have advice for the companies on how to manage negative reports or feedback? from just one or two users and it goes viral in the channels or the experience because it all looks very um, positive and mm. yeah, I think I can have that but there is this portion where what happens when things don't go quite yeah. as what they would like to um, I suppose our advice is um, um, with, a, with a note of caution for, for the reasons you just said, embrace it You've, you've got to get involved. So get in there, start talking, start you know, uh, listening, make sure there's a dialogue going on and, um, and, and kind of get involved. That's, that's really the first thing. I think um, the second thing is expect 100% transparency. You, know, you will get found out if you're doing something that's inappropriate or, or you know, if you're Volkswagen, for example. You know. uh, I mean, you might all have different views on, on the, the Volkswagen story, but, um, but you know, that, that bit of software that they engineered to kind of give uh, false results or whatever, you know, I, I suspect most car brands are probably doing things that are similar to that, but they just got found out. And, and that has just you know, hit them like a rock, like a meteorite. So, so there are things like that that are, you know, might come out in the wash. So you've got to be very clean and you've got to be transparent. Uh, and I think if you 
if you engage in social media activity in the right way, you know, you expect to be found out. But we also see, I mean, you know, Nike and the whole thing about kind of sweatshops in China and, you know, all the manufacturing stuff, they've ridden through that. And, uh, and I think, I hope that they've done quite a lot to put it right. But, um, and I don't know for sure, but none of us do. But, um, but I think, you know, you can ride through these things if you're doing enough good stuff to sort of counterbalance the, the bad stuff. So long as the bad stuff isn't really bad, like Volkswagen getting found out. So, but, you know, we talk about brands in the social age. This is the social age. And if you're not part of it, you're going to get lost. You're going to be a loser. So it's kind of, it's no choice really. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's about having the right um, program and, and just orchestrating it well. But brands that try and control it, big mistake. I think, you know, you, you've just got to let people say what they want to say and then just make sure that you're doing enough good stuff. Because what's interesting, I think when, when people really first started talking online, it tended to be all the bad stuff. People didn't bother if it was all good. They only got online and talked about stuff when it was bad. Now it's actually almost the opposite. It's, uh, you know, everyone likes to share a good story, so, um, so everyone likes to post it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. I think my experience is that um, you mentioned there's a lot of coffee joints in, in Singapore, and you do have a lot of coffee shops that are really good at selling good things. Mm. Positive, um, absolutely. And, uh, you know, in the media, it's like any publicity, whether good or bad, is still publicity. Yeah. So bad news may drive more people to check them out. Absolutely. And, and of course, most, in most cases, people aren't reading all the individual comments. They're looking at the aggregated result. You know, so is it three and a half stars or four stars? So there's a great app called Bean Hunter. If, if you're into coffee, if you haven't seen Bean, Bean Hunter, great app works in different parts of the world but it works here in Singapore and, it, and you can find great coffee but that's all driven by you know a uh, recommendation engine and a star rating so you can see what people are saying about it so yeah but the, you know the aggregation that comes with it is also really important you know because if you're getting down in the one and a half one star kind of you know then you know you, you need to do something <laughs> It's a work. You know, I just had one question mm. uh, in the area of experiential marketing. You, if you look at the evolution, it's here's a great brand, here's a great service that goes with the brand, and here's the great experience. I'm looking at the last the component that you talked about, sorry, on the human resource side. Mm. Um, from your experience working with clients, what does it take in terms of incremental skills, uh, personalities, and so forth to make that kind of great uh, provider? not just a service provider, but an experience creator uh, for, for your brands? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think you're touching there probably on one of the, as well as the metrics, I think that's the other kind of big challenge for, for the industry and for brands um, is, is service. Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, retail has become a, a, a kind of unattractive industry for a lot of people. It's not a, it's not a profession for a lot of people, particularly working in stores, except for Apple stores. I mean, people are queuing up to work in Apple stores, but they're, you know, reluctantly working in, you know, fashion stores. I mean, they queue up to work in Uniglo's, for example, which are not, you know, necessarily usually glamorous, but they just like the brand and things. So, um, you know, I, I, I think in a, in a nutshell, it's about, you know, um, being a brand that has a, a very positive belief. I think it's, uh, it's about you know, being a, a brand that's, that's pretty transparent and, um, and just uh, uh, a brand that's trying to do good stuff for people. And, um, and I think if people believe in that, I mean, I uh, had a great experience a couple of months ago and I test drove a Tesla in, in the US. So if, if you're in the US and you're just walking by a Tesla showroom, go in and test drive the car, it's amazing. But um, the guy that was working there was working there because he loved you know, the whole story, he loved what uh, Elon Musk is doing, and he just wanted to be involved. And he didn't expect it to be his long-term career profession, but he just wanted to get involved. I mean, you know, and if you can, if you can build advocacy like that, I think the staff training will take care of itself, because they're going to know everything about you. But it's hard, and we do a lot of work in the hospitality sector, and I think there are a lot of lessons there where, you know, you're trying to kind of um, 
I mean, the hospitality sector, I think, is trying to upgrade service from being these standard operating procedures where everyone does things the same way and it's really boring to, um, to you know, much more genuine staff engagement. So I think, you know, there are places there where we can learn some lessons and, uh, and, and figure things out on a big scale because obviously they're doing it pretty widely. So, uh, but, it, but it's a huge challenge. What about luxury brands? Uh, leveraging what you just said, um, luxury brands base everything on ex exclusivity. But then now, with social media and all that, everything has become more democratized. Mm. And it's hard to control. You're talking, you said just now you have to embrace it, and then you have to try to, brands have to, to, try to control that. But you can't really control people's opinions and when once that goes viral that's the end of it right? mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's harder to, to, to change that so you can you can talk about touch points you can control all of that like in-store experience maybe even the website but now if you look at luxury brands let us say Givenchy has gone to no Beaumont you know as they embrace social media that's because the designer is really big into it Chanel has gone really slow when it comes to into anything to do with online stuff um, Michael Kors has done use a brand mm -hmm. want Michael Kors here. <laughs> You know, because yep. of you know this lack of, of uh, experience or understanding for what's happening online, what do you tell luxury brands when it comes to this? Um, I mean, I think the rules are kind of the same. Uh, I think the exclusivity is really important, and um, I think exclusivity um, now revolves more around experiences than products. So I think limited editions, for example, might still have their place, but I think being invited to a a private catwalk show is more currency for people these days than um, uh, than necessarily the, the product. But that said, um, I mean, I think until recently Burberry have been doing a really good job. I think they're the you know in some ways the sort of standard for for social media engagement in the luxury uh, category. But I think even there they've, they've they've been found out a bit recently. So um, I don't know. I don't I don't have a simple answer um, because. For me, it's this sort of balance between, um, uh, you know, you, you kind of open yourself up to the world. They're going to talk about you. You want them to talk about you. There are going to be some negative comments. But if you're a good person, generally, the balance will be, you know, good. And, and I, think, um, I, think, I think that's genuinely true for, for most brands. You know, you, you look at the online chat about Apple. You know, there's a lot of people that really don't like Apple with a vengeance, you know, and... Uh, and really give it a hard time, but there's a lot of people that obviously do, and and and, and kind of keep the sort of positive momentum going. So, um, so I don't know. I I I think um, you know luxury is more targeted and and and, and I think more, more segmented and stuff. But but I think the principles are still the same. Oh, up there. Another question. Yeah. Um, Um, I think it's really hard to generalise, to be honest. I mean, I think, um, you know, with startups, it, it really depends which category they're in, how broad they're trying to be, who they're, who they're targeting. I mean, if they're targeting a small cluster in a defined area, then maybe a showroom is a great place to bring those people together and create sort of the start of a community and, and kind of build up from there. But if they're targeting the world and, they, you know, they want everyone that's five foot six inches tall that's got you know this complexion and that you know that 
music choice and you know and, and it becomes a very distinct but very dispersed kind of target then that's probably not the way to go because you know you're only going to get a very small cross-section of those people um, so um, you know it, it's, it's a different strategy I mean we're working with a um, uh, a company in Australia that have a very interesting kind of ingredient product uh, and they're kind of unique in the world with this ingredient product and um, and it you know it could uh, be a, a, a very interesting um, uh, kind of business in terms of beauty care and wellness and well-being, uh, all sorts of things. And um, and we're, we're we're advising them not to really focus on shops in terms of retail uh, from the outset, um, and and really start building the brand like a startup, but driven by more social media activity. And I think if you look at like the emerging brands in the beauty category, because that's going through a major change uh, um, at the moment, all the emerging brands have been built online. They don't have stores. Um, so it's kind of, in, you know, it's, it's a very interesting question and, and, and a topic to discuss. I mean, we could probably stay here the rest of the afternoon and discuss it. But, um, but I think, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of lessons to be learned by tracking the startups and seeing how they're going, the Airbnbs, the Ubers, I mean, everyone's talking about Uberizing different categories and stuff like that. It's become a verb, right? Um, so, so I suppose a lot of people are seeing those models as reference points and thinking how they can kind of apply them. Um, but I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all thing. All right, I'm sure we have uh, further questions. I'm sure you can have a personal contact with uh, Ian. But I think on behalf of Prof. Sini in the centre, I'd like to... Uh, join all of us and uh, say it very much a great thank you to Ian and uh, thank you. Like to a small oh. of our appreciation thank you very much you remember us thank, thank you. you very much thank you thank you thank Thanks you everybody for coming thank you Ian thank you